Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and I'm here today with my awesome pathology and dermatology residents and Dermpath fellows. Well, actually, they're not here with me right now because when I first recorded this session, the first part of the recording failed. So cases one through eight, I'm going to go back and re-record right now, and then you'll hear the, uh, the uh, residents chime in later. So that's why. All right, this is case one. Here we've got a punch biopsy that's been bisected, and the left side here looks different than the right, okay? So let's go down and look at the left side, which is where the classic findings are. We've got a blister. It's an intraepidermal blister. There's some uh, basal layer keratinocytes retained down here on the floor of the blister, and the roof has separated, and in the blister cavity, you can see, once it comes into focus, that there are free-floating keratinocytes here, that have detached from one another. So that's acantholysis. So there's some immunobullous diseases like pemphigus, for example, that can have acantholysis and blistering. But this is not immunobullous. This is actually a viral disease. And I forgot to mention at the start, we're gonna be talking about viral diseases today and a few mimics. So here we have detached acantholytic keratinocytes that are rounded up, some necrotic material in here. And it's hard to see in these cells, but let's go down here into this uh, opening of a hair follicle and if we look closer, we can see the classic cytologic features here. These are keratinocytes that have multinucleation, molding of their nuclei together, and margination of their chromatin, the three Ms of herpes. And that can be seen in both in herpes simplex virus and also varicella zoster uh, VZV, which is what this is right here. This is VZV. And the only way to definitively know that is, is by doing an immunostain or PCR. Uh, to tell apart uh, simplex and zoster. The cytopathic change looks the same for both of them, at least to my eye. Uh, the one other, uh, obviously also the clinical presentation usually can help you quite a bit. If it's spreading along a dermatome, then it's zoster, right? Um, almost certainly, or if it's, you know, a lesion on the lips or on the genitals, it's more likely simplex. Um, one other microscopic clue is if you have a lot of hair follicle involvement, that tends to be more common in varicella zoster. And uh, one thought for that is that in, in zoster, the, uh, you know, the virus goes and resides in the sensory nerve ganglia. And then when the uh, virus reactivates, it spreads back through sensory nerves along the dermatome. And then uh, some of those nerves, it seems, um, uh, connect to the root of the hair follicle and allow the virus to first uh, infect the cells there, the keratinocytes in the hair follicle root, and then from there spread up into the epidermis. So that's why we see, we tend to see herpes folliculitis or follicular involvement by herpes more often in zoster than in simplex. But this is a perfect example of the three M's of herpes, and some people will make a fourth M and say mega cells, meaning the cells are really big and large uh, because they are enlarged. Um, the central part of the nucleus has this kind of hazy ground glass, I'm using air quotes here, or frosted glass appearance, this smudgy kind of gray uh, look, and that's um, because I think they're filled with viral particles, and then the DNA gets pushed out to the side and compressed along the margin of the nucleus, along the nuclear membrane. It looks like a uh, someone took a, a dark, you know, purple uh, marker and, and drew around uh, the outside of the nucleus. So those are the classic cytopathic changes of herpes. Uh, sometimes they're really perfect, like here. Other times you kind of hallucinate them a little bit in the dead and dying keratinocytes in the center of the blister cavity. And that's especially true when there's a lot of necrosis, a lot of inflammation and neutrophils, which is actually, I would say, more often than not what I see in herpes is I see this really inflamed necrotic um, ulcer. Maybe the blister's not even visible anymore because of how much necrosis and inflammation there is. So look at the uh, adnexal structures to try to find the best viral cytopathic effect. Also, I find looking at the free-floating cells in the lumen, like we saw earlier, or excuse me, in the blister cavity, and also looking over here at the peripheral edge where the blister um, or the ulcer meets with the uh, intact viable epidermis, you can see some viral cytopathic effect right there. So I find those are the best places to look for viral effects. And then uh, oftentimes I will do the immunostains for HSV 1 and 2 versus VZV uh, because I have them readily available in my lab. Um, uh, and I find that my treating physician colleagues, my dermatologist colleagues usually like to know um, if there's any doubt clinically which one it would be, they like to know because they do uh, uh, change the medication regimen to some extent uh, based on that. So uh, you can uh, talk to your clinical treating, um, uh, treating physician colleagues to see if they need to know the difference or not. Otherwise, I just call it herpetic dermatitis 
and had a comment that I can do the stains to sort out HSV versus VZV if clinically uh, indicated upon request. So this is herpes. Oh, and then the other side here, I think it's worth uh, taking a look here. This is a kind of a what happens when the uh, roof of the blister has totally sloughed off and, and been detached. And uh, this is true of any sort of acantholytic blister that you can lose the, uh, the surface because it's, it's lost its connection with the base of the epidermis. And so uh, it can detach and either be lost during processing or sometimes be found floating elsewhere on the slide. You can see, just like you would see in pemphigus, you've got kind of a tombstone row of basal keratinocytes that are mostly intact. But here there is, it's subtle, but there are some uh, hints of viral cytopathic effect there, which is a clue that we may be dealing with herpes. And when we go over here and look down this uh, adnexal epithelium, I'm not sure if it's a hair follicle or a sweat duct here, but you can see better uh, multinucleation margination and molding and that smudgy, uh, hazy ground glass a nuclear uh, chromatin pattern that's typical of herpes. All right. And a lot of inflammation in the background dermis, another typical finding in herpes. Case two. Here we've got a cyst. At first glance, you think this is a, an epidermoid cyst or an epidermal inclusion cyst, as pathologists like to call them sometimes, or a as surgeons call them, a sebaceous cyst, which is not at all accurate because there's nothing sebaceous about these, as uh, pathologists all know, I think. But in any case, whatever name you like, it looks like a keratin-filled benign cyst. So it would be good for an epidermoid cyst, but there's something a little extra and special here. And that's when we look at the epithelial lining of the cyst. It does look like epidermis, like you'd see in an epidermoid cyst, epidermal inclusion cyst, or follicular infundibular cyst, if you like that name. But, but the lining is, is papillomatous. It has kind of finger-shaped projections uh, that stick up into the lumen. It's kind of got a warty look to it. There's also uh, parakeratosis, that kind of rounded up parakeratosis that we often see in the setting of HPV virus, uh, like in Veruca vulgaris. And you can even see some cells that are larger in the, uh, in the granular layer here that are larger and have kind of pale cytoplasm and enlarged nuclei. And these cells, uh, to my eye, resemble coilocytes. So this looks like an epidermoid cyst, except the surface lining has the changes of a Veruca vulgaris. So this is called a Verrucous cyst, and it's basically uh, got similar features to epidermoid cyst, but also with uh, lining changes that look a lot like Veruca vulgaris. And these are due to HPV infection and um, uh, there are various, uh, uh, there, it's uncertain what exact types of HPV are found in these. Not a lot of studies have been done on those, uh, but occasional rare case reports have identified the subtype. But in any case, it looks like a wart, but turned into a cyst, basically. So you'll get hypergranulosis, papillomatosis, parakeratosis, and um, sometimes you'll see coilocytes. And the lining tends to look like uh, epidermoid cyst or follicular and fundibular cyst, but sometimes it can also look like pilar cyst or trichelemal cyst, whichever name you prefer for that entity. So you can have kind of a variability in the cyst lining, but it's benign and it has warty changes. And this is, I think, a very nice example of a verrucous cyst. So a benign verrucous cyst, just a, a kind of curiosity to know about. I only rarely encounter these in my practice. I, I'd say less than once a year, probably. Or if I'm seeing them more often than that, I'm, I'm, they must be very subtle and I'm not recognizing them. So just keep this in mind. If you see an unusual looking cyst that looks kind of warty, verrucous cyst. Case number three, this is a nail clipping, uh, thickened nails with abundant subungual debris. You can see over here, uh, this linear piece right here that's dense and compact, that's nail plate. Here's nail plate also. And most of this stuff here is subungual keratin debris. Uh, it's nothing very exciting about it, except there's a ton of it here. And we sometimes see very thick dystrophic nails with abundant debris that looks kind of like this at first glance. But when we look closer here, there are multiple uh, large holes in the keratin material. And within those holes, once it comes to focus, we will see there is some some there are some structures here. Some of this is pink, kind of wavy, curvy material. Here's some right here. 
And some of these curl around and people have likened this to uh, pigtails, like the tails on a pig that are like little curly pink pigtails. And uh, if you've seen this before, you'll know right away what this is a clue for. But I'll show you, here's a, an intact, although squished example of what that pigtail used to be. This is an egg, and that's the, the contents of the egg kind of crushed here, and then the egg shell. And once that egg hatches, the uh, remnants of the eggshell left behind here are these pink pigtails, and these are the eggs or the eggshell remnants of scabies. So these are scabies um, uh, eggs, and there are hundreds of them here. It makes your skin or nails crawl and itch just thinking about this. There are numerous scabies uh, mites and eggs and eggshell fragments here underneath the nails. So this is a scabies infestation of the nail or subungual scabies. And in this case, we would classify it as crusted scabies because of the numerous, numerous mites and mite parts that are present here. Here's a fragment of a mite. It's kind of out of focus in this scan, so you can't really see it. But I think there's another better example over here. I don't think I've actually seen a real case of subungual uh, scabies in practice. Uh, but it is out there, so be on the lookout for it. Um, and here, once it comes into view, you can see the scabies mite. That's right here in its burrow. Here's the space, the burrow. So it's the same kind of findings we'd see in regular scabies of the skin or regular crusted scabies of the skin. In this case, it's just underneath the nail plate. Um, and here you can see the mite with its exoskeleton that has this kind of wavy, wrinkled, crinkled border, some areas of yellow chitin, that are there in the exoskeleton like we see in, in uh, scabies and ticks and other arthropods. There's even a few little spines or hair-like projections here on the surface, which is another feature that we see in, in scabies. So this is an adult scabies mite here, and then we had the pigtails of the eggshells, and then we had individual eggs, and all of this with abundant parakeratosis underneath the nail plate, so subungual uh, crusted scabies. And this is case four. We have a large excision of skin here. You can see this is the normal epidermis for, for uh, comparison and contrast. Normal epidermis here, and you can see abundant pigment. This is a dark skin, darkly pigmented um, individual. And then the skin suddenly gets much thicker. Um, the epidermis gets very thick and it looks a lot like, uh, kind of like lichen simplex chronicus with you know, this reactive thickening of the epidermis like you'd see in uh, scratching or rubbing or itching of the skin with some spongiosis. So if you just had this, I mean, I think it'd be very reasonable to think that this could be a spongiotic dermatitis that's been scratched a lot. But then over on this side, it starts getting way, way thicker and you have these large expanded uh, reedy ridges that push down into the dermis, deeply into the dermis and get kind of bulbous and expanded at the bottom and they have a very pale pink abundant cytoplasm in these keratinocytes. And uh, as it comes into focus here, we'll see that there's abundant, what we call the abundant pink uh, that's kind of smudgy and homogenized. We call that glassy, glassy or homogenized. And the, the word hyalinized could also be used. Hyalos is the Greek word for, uh, for glass, at least in, in ancient Greek, I believe. And so when we say hyalinized in pathology, we mean kind of homogenous, smudgy pink and we use that word for lots of different things, but this is glassy, glassy cytoplasm here. And uh, the keratinocyte nuclei are actually quite small and bland. There's not very much cytologic nuclear atypia here, just abundant glassy cytoplasm and these broad, big reedy that are becoming bulbous and expanded and pushing deeply into the dermis. And on the surface, there is some degree of kind of verrucous uh, architectural change, not really prominent in this case here, but over here, you can see there's a little bit of kind of warty look to the surface. So this is verrucous carcinoma. And uh, despite uh, the name and despite what the uh, older uh, and sometimes even uh, more modern articles say, uh, my, my understanding at least is that our current thinking is that verrucous carcinoma is not actually HPV associated. But when you go read about this in the literature, there's a lot of overlap between the term verrucous carcinoma and giant condyloma of Bushke and Lowenstein and carcinoma caniculatum. And these words have been used uh, interchangeably or overlappingly in the past. And so it's made the literature, especially the older literature, incredibly difficult to understand and muddy. 
But uh, my view and, and understanding is that these are not actually HPV associated. They are different from a true condyloma that's very large. Um, but both of them uh, can be locally uh, kind of aggressive. And so in, in, in any case, um, I think there are similar concerns and considerations for how these are handled clinically. Uh, there is a more nuanced discussion than we have time for today, but I'll put a link to a great article about, um, about um, anogenital squamous proliferations uh, by uh, Dr. May Chan uh, in Archives of Pathology. And it's act, uh, just a beautifully written and illustrated article um, uh, that Dr. Chan did a wonderful job with. And I just really recommend everybody who who's struggles with how to, uh, what, what words to use for anogenital squamous lesions uh, to go read that article. So I'll put a link down below. It's freely available uh, from Archives of Pathology. But, um, and I've also got some other videos about verrucous carcinoma if you want a more in-depth discussion. But basically just know that it is kind of verrucous on the surface, usually, in this case not so much, has abundant um, uh, uh, dense keratin, often parakeratosis, glassy expanded reedy, but no nuclear atypia, and is HPV negative. And um, these often arise in the anogenital region, but you also see them on the sole of the foot and also in the oral cavity, although I think in the oral cavity they look a little bit different and a little more subtle to my eye, but I don't do a ton of oral pathology, so I still find a lot of oral, oral pathology lesions very challenging. So on a superficial biopsy, a superficial shave, this tumor can be almost impossible, and in some cases truly impossible to diagnose. You really usually have to see the base of the lesion to see if they're expanded, pushing, type invasion down at the bottom. And also you usually have to have the clinical um, um, uh, information to know how big of a lesion is this. These are usually large lesions that deeply push into the dermis. And the other thing, and I'll again, I'll put a link down to below to a video that discusses this in more depth. I have found that at the periphery of verrucous carcinoma, sometimes you see stuff that looks more like lichen simplex chronicus and really doesn't have those glassy expanded reedy. I mean, if I just had a biopsy of this, I would not call it verrucous carcinoma personally. Um, I would say LSC or I, I, would, I would wonder about different things, but I would uh, not really think of, of verrucous carcinoma. But I have seen cases where there was stuff like this that I thought was not verrucous carcinoma that went out to the margin and I thought the margins were negative and then the tumor recurred. A couple of times actually recurred. So I've, I'm convinced that there are times that verrucous carcinoma can have areas that really um, are, are very difficult to distinguish from reactive epidermal hyperplasia and, um, and yet still probably represent a component of verrucous carcinoma. So I now add a little comment that, you know, I don't see obvious verrucous carcinoma at the margins, but if there's any stuff that looks like this, I'll say that, you know, I can't be totally sure and to closely follow the patient. So uh, verrucous carcinoma, just a very short um, uh, discussion of it and a pretty nice example though here. And remember, if it looks kind of verrucous, and yet has a lot of atypia, then that probably uh, is better to regard as a, a conventional squamous cell carcinoma. In some squames have a warty surface, but I would not call those verrucous carcinoma. And if you're frustrated and confused by this terminology, you're in good company. I find it frustrating and confusing as well, as do I think many other pathologists that I've talked to. So it's, it's a struggle and the, uh, the overlapping literature in the past has made it even harder to understand. All right. Oh, and I did forget to mention one other thing about verrucous carcinoma that's important to know, and I, uh, not to belabor this, is that it is locally aggressive and has a high risk of local recurrence, but, but true verrucous carcinoma has essentially no metastatic potential unless it converts into a conventional squamous cell carcinoma, which can happen sometimes, at least from what I've been taught. And so uh, once it, if it transitions into a more conventional squamous cell carcinoma with obvious cytologic atypia, then of course it would have metastatic potential. But otherwise, the biggest issue here is one of local control and aggressive local growth and high risk of recurrence um, rather than a risk of metastasis. So that's the other important consideration about verrucous carcinoma as opposed to other forms of squamous cell carcinoma. All right, case five. This is a nice treat because this is something that at least in my practice, I've only very rarely seen biopsies of, although it's not exactly a rare disease depending on where you live. So this is a case of ORF, also known as ecthyma contagiosum. And don't confuse that with the two other ecthymas, the uh, kind of conventional ecthyma, which I think is usually caused by strep, a streptococcus, and it leaves little punched out lesions in the skin. It's kind of like a deeper form of 
of impetigo is the way I've had it explained to me and something I don't see biopsy very often. And then there's also ecthyma gangrenosum, which is uh, necrotic lesions in the skin caused by pseudomonas. But this is ecthyma contagiosum and is actually a viral disease, which is caused by a parapox virus. And ORF is a disease that's, that's most commonly seen in sheep, uh, where it goes by the name in, I think in Australia, it's called scabby mouth. Um, and the, um, in communities, uh, farming communities where a lot of sheep are raised, um, among sheep farmers, they've done some surveys, I think in the UK in the past, and found that over 20% of uh, farmers uh, have reported having lesions of ORF uh, at some point in their life. So I think it's well recognized in people that work with sheep. Um, and in sheep, it leaves this ulcerated kind of uh, polypoid granulation tissue looking lesions around the mouth of the sheep. And then those are weepy and ulcerated. And so if you have contact with those, um, you can get a similar lesion that grows in the skin, often on the hands from direct contact. So the uh, kind of a chain of events is that if you touch uh, a lesion or contaminated surface, I guess, that has the, the ORF uh, virus, uh, you will get a, about a week later, you can get a papule on your skin, and then that can progress to a pustule or a hemorrhagic blister. And then over time, that will uh, kind of have a depressed center and it will begin to scab and crust and over a few weeks will eventually resolve and go away. And so depending on where you biopsy in that process, the lesion may look different. But there are a few characteristic features here in ORF. Uh, one of the, two of the most uh, important things, at least when I learned about ORF, is that you have really dramatic elongation of the reedy ridges. The reedy are very long and often thin. And then the dermis underneath has massive edema, often with inflammation and a proliferation of blood vessels. So kind of this reactive angioplasia that, that looks similar to kind of granulation tissue. Sometimes I've seen it so robust. Um, in one other case, I'll show you in a moment, uh, one of the few cases of ORF that I've seen in the past that had areas that looked almost like a pyogenic granuloma or a lobular capillary hemangioma. And in fact, these, uh, these can mimic pyogenic granuloma clinically. So no, no surprise there. So you have massive edema uh, with a brisk lymphocytic infiltrate in this case, a dilated proliferation of blood vessels in the papillary dermis, and then long, skinny, thin reedy. And then often you will also get spongiosis of the epidermis and the keratinocytes will become very pale and, and kind of have this balloon, ballooning uh, degeneration or reticular degeneration where the keratinocytes get large, they get pale cytoplasm, they get intermingled with abundant spongiosis, and then they uh, kind of start to strand and fall apart from one another. So that mixture of large pale keratinocytes with edema, spongiosis in the background, necrosis, and falling apart of the epidermis, all of those things together, however you want to think of that, is often called reticular degeneration or ballooning degeneration of the epidermis. And it's a pattern that is commonly seen in, in viral infections, particularly ORF, and also we can see it in hand, foot, and mouth disease caused by Coxsackie virus, has a very similar uh, degeneration or reticular degeneration of the epidermis to what we see here, okay? So keep that pattern in mind right there. Think about viral if you see that. All right, the, um, let's see up here, I'll let this piece get into focus. And then also you'll get ulceration and crusting of the, uh, of the epidermis as well, as you can imagine when you get this massive edema and the epidermis is starting to fall apart and die. And then there's hemorrhage underneath. And, um, and uh, in this case, there's neutrophils on the surface and also probably some secondary bacterial overgrowth or impetigenization by uh, skin flora bacteria on the surface here, as you can see in any sort of crusted, weeping uh, skin lesion that's ulcerated. All right, so those are the features of ORF. And then the, the final thing is that people often talk about, um, although uh, based on the few cases of ORF I've seen, I think these are kind of hard to find, but there are these small pink or red cytoplasmic inclusions that are supposed to be very typical of ORF. But I find that when I've gone and looked at these cases, I have found some things that I thought might fit for the cytoplasmic inclusions, but I've never been totally certain if they truly are the viral inclusion or if they represent uh, uh, red cells that are extravasated and sitting on top of the keratinocytes or degenerated necrotic keratinocyte debris. So I, I can find little pink dots and tell you, oh, look, it's an inclusion. 
But in my heart, I'm not 100% sure if I'm really seeing the viral inclusion. Again, this is based on only a very few cases of ORP I've seen in real life. So here's a red uh, little uh, area that looks like an inclusion, although this is larger than a lot of the inclusions that get shown in the textbook. I think over here there was another one, if I can find it again, that I thought was reasonable. So if you think this is uh, not good teaching or that I don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. Um, like I said, I, I have uh, limited experience with this, but this is a feature that gets taught in books, but I feel like in real life is relatively hard to be sure that you're seeing because there's lots of little pink fragments and dots that we can see in skin biopsy, especially when there's a lot of inflammation and necrosis. See, here's a pink dot. Is that an inclusion? I think that might be, but you know, a dead keratinocyte can look kind of similar to that too. Okay, let me show you a different case. Um, this was one of the cases of ORP that I saw in, uh, in the past. And this one you can see is even larger and more dramatic than the last case. And it has uh, incredible elongation and thinning of the reedy and massive papillary dermal edema that's just like expanded the papillary dermis and stretched out those reedy so long and thin. And then there's a lot of blood and a lot of proliferation of reactive blood vessels underneath this. In this case, um, if I recall correctly, was a patient who was a transplant patient, so it was immunosuppressed, and was um, was slaughtering a, a goat, I believe, uh, uh, doing like halal slaughtering of a goat for a feast that was going to be be prepared, and accidentally cut themselves, and then at the site um, got a really massive lesion of ORF, and we think that it was probably um, much more dramatic in this patient because of their immune suppression. Okay, so uh, this is just another example. And again, look at how dramatic and proliferative those blood vessels are down in the dermis. I mean, you could really wonder about pyogenic granuloma. You could think about Kaposi sarcoma or bacillary angiomatosis. You could think about a variety of other, of other things there. All right, uh, and um, just more views of that. And then here, I believe, there's a convincing example of the viral, uh, pink viral inclusion in a keratinocyte here. I think that's the real deal. That's what it looks like in the book, at least. So those little pink dots are supposed to be the classic finding for ORF. But like I told you, I think you got to hunt forever to find one. And even then, I'm not totally sure. So I would rely more on the other features we talked about. And then, of course, putting it together with the clinical as the patient had exposure to sheep or goats. Um, sometimes in uh, in... The community where I live, we have a rural a farming community, and a lot of times there's like a county fair once a year, a big fair in the town where I live. And uh, I've heard that after um, after the fair, because there's a lot of people showing sheep and um, and a lot of people petting sheep, that afterwards the incidence of ORF uh, will uh, will uh, increase, and people will sometimes see ORF soon after that fair. So it depends on the community you live in whether or not you might see this and when you might see it. So that's, I think, a very uh, real deal, convincing example of ORF. So uh, something we don't see very often biopsy, at least. All right, case number six. Here we've got a punch biopsy, and the uh, surface of the skin is ulcerated. There's some necrosis of the epidermis here as it comes into focus. The dermis is very smudgy and pink and kind of hyalinized with blood and some fibrin. Part of this is pink because it's an old pale slide, but also part of it, I think, is because the, it, there's a beginning of necrosis here in this kind of zone. And even though it is very pale, there are scattered eosinophils and lymphocytes in the dermis here. So changes you could see um, in a bug bite, but not specific in this case. But in fact, we do have a finding that confirms, yes, it is a bug bite. Uh, actually not a bug, but another arthropod. This is a bit of tick mouth part here. So this is uh, this yellow refractile material is chitin, which is a carbohydrate that makes up parts of the cell wall of uh, ticks, and in, uh, which are actually uh, arachnids, not um, insects. Although I guess some people use bugs, uh, bug as a term to encompass both insect and other you know, creepy crawly things. So it depends on how, uh, how specific you want to be about what the word bug means to you. But in any case, we have a, an arthropod here and you can see a little spine sticking out of it. So this is part of the tick mouth part that was retained and left at the site where the tick bit the patient. And sometimes we will see this a, a persistent um, retained ar uh, mouth parts from a tick can cause a persistent tick bite reaction that eventually gets removed by punch biopsy because the patients had you know inflammation and discomfort at the site for long after the you know after the tick was originally removed from the skin and that's because there's still some mouth parts there and the immune system is is mounting an immune response to those retained 
mouth parts. I find that you often see um, variable amounts of inflammation with the eosinophils around um, the tick mouth parts, and particularly in that wedge shape that's typical of arthropod bite reaction. And um, it does get this smudgy pink look and kind of necrotic fibrinoid looking dermis. So if I ever see bug bite reaction with this smudgy pink dying kind of area of dermis, I'll often cut deeper and look uh, hopefully to find a tick mouth part on the deeper sections. So if you get lucky, you'll find one, all right? And anytime you find a fragment of arthropod, the next step is figuring out what type of arthropod is it. If it's, you know, embedded at the site of an arthropod bite reaction, then that's more likely a tick mouth part. If it's bigger than this and down in a hole, uh, down in a cavity in the deep dermis or subcutis, and the patient traveled to Central America, then it's probably a bot fly larva. If it's uh, made of arthropod parts and it's a massive uh, lesion in the foot underneath the epidermis, then that might be tongiasis. If it's a small little lesion, um, in the stratum corneum, then that might be a scabies mite. So you have to look at where the arthropod part is located, how big it is, what the clinical scenario is, and sometimes also take the travel history into account. And then you can figure out where that arthropod, um, what type of arthropod you're dealing with. And the other thing is, uh, occasionally I find arthropod parts that have been um, um, contaminants, basically, like especially on a large uh, chronic ulcer, I've sometimes found or on top of an ulcerated like skin tumor. I've seen sometimes little bits of arthropod that got stuck in the, the crust. Um, so that's another time you can see arthropods microscopically that probably are not what's causing the problem in the patient. So, so whether those are like fly larva, maggots, uh, or, or little gnats or other um, environmental small um, insects uh, that got stuck on the, the oozy surface of an ulcer. Um, uh, those are things also that could sometimes come in the differential. But in this case, it fit for tick, and that's uh, morphologically compatible with the tick mouth part. Now, this is case seven, and this is just a fantastic example of something I've never actually seen in practice uh, because of where I live and work in the United States, where this is something that is not endemic. So um, this is an oncosarcoma. This is a nodule uh, that is uh, composed of an adult, one or more adult uh, worms of uh, the uh, Oncocerca um, genus. And so Oncocerca, I think the species is usually Oncocerca volvulus. And this is the worm that causes river blindness and Oncocerciasis, of which there are a variety of different clinical presentations. So Oncocerca is m mostly seen in Africa. I believe there are a few other tropical places where it can be found endemically, but the, the vast majority of people that, um, that um, are at risk for getting Oncocerca infection um, uh, are in Africa. And so uh, the life cycle of Oncocerca, what happens is that these are a worm that has a microfilarial stage, it means a little tiny thread-like worm is what microfilaria is. The microfilaria gets um, sucked out of the skin of a infected host person by a fly, a black fly called a simul simulium. And the simulium black fly gets the larva, the larva develop, the microfilaria larva develop in their GI tract. Then the next time the fly bites someone, those larva uh, get out of the fly and into the skin of the uh, next victim. And then the microfilaria proliferate throughout the skin and, and infect the skin of the person and eventually mature into adults. The adult worms get coiled together into a ball, usually in the deep dermis or subcutis, and that's what we see here. The body mounts a kind of a response against it and encases this ball of uh, adult worm in fibrosis and inflammation. So you get this scarred off nodule with some granulomatous stuff and various amounts of inflammation. That is the body's attempt to wall off these worms. But what the worms are doing is mating and reproducing, and you can see that inside the cross-section of this adult worm, there are many cross-sections of the worm here, we have paired uteri, uteruses, one on this side, one on this side, and inside the uteri are billions, I don't know how many, but many, 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 bajillion little tiny microfilarial worms. So each of those little tiny individual things is a little baby microfilarial worm, 
And once those are uh, born or released from the adult, they will then infest throughout the person's skin and sometimes get into other parts of the body as well, like the eyes where they can cause blindness, and that's the so-called river blindness. In the skin, they cause intense itching and cause um, uh, really dramatic uh, hypopigmentation intermingled with hyperpigmentation that people have called you know, leopard spot skin or they've used different types of words to compare it because it causes this spotty kind of unique sort of uh, pigment variation in the skin. It can cause uh, lymphedema changes, chronic lymphedema changes, and sagging, hanging folds of skin uh, around the fold sites of the body, like the abdominal panis. It can cause all sorts of really terrible, morbid problems for the patients that have to suffer from this. So the adult worm makes this nodule. The microfilaria, though, cause much more, I think, of the morbidity and, and problems. And then those microfilaria are the ones that get uh, taken up by the fly when the fly bites the uh, host uh, who has, is, has an infection with them. And those microfilaria then start the cycle all over again. So I'll put a link down below. There's a nice graphic on the CDC website that shows the uh, life cycle of the, uh, of the Oncocerca uh, worm. So this is a good example of a cross section with the paired uteri filled with microfilaria. And again, look at how many cross sections there are. So the microfilaria are very, very tiny, but the adult worms are actually quite long. I think they can be, um, I think several feet long actually, like almost, uh, I think almost up to a meter in length if I recall correctly. Um, it's been a little while since I read the chapter on this. So um, in any case, they can be a lot longer and they are tangled and coiled up into this ball together here. And that's the Oncocerca. Uh, or onchocercoma, kind of meaning like almost a pseudo tumor made of onchocerca worms. And then over here, I'm going to show you this side, and I'm going to actually get this slide re scanned um, uh, from the study set, and then I'll post it on uh, my Kiko account and put a link down below because this is just such a great example of something that's so rare that I may never encounter in my real life practice and only was able to see in this great study set um, provided to me by my friend, Dr. Tammy Beringer. Uh, my friend and colleague. Uh, all right, and so here, once it comes into focus, you can see a more longitudinal section um, showing the adult worm with the, uh, the uh, uteri that are gravid and full of microfilarial worms. So a really, a really uh, amazing example of a disease that is, um, is a very morbid and problematic in, um, in Africa and some other tropical parts of the world. And in the background, as you'd imagine, a lot of eosinophils and various amounts of reactive uh, change. Oh, and I will have one other point. If you see something similar to this and you're say in North America and the patient has no travel history and you might see some degenerated area that looks a little bit like a worm, um, uh, uh, Dyrofilaria, the dog heartworm, uh, can sometimes uh, infect humans, although it, my understanding is it cannot live long term in humans. So in humans, it does not cause heart infection, but instead the worm gets into the skin or subcutis or sometimes the lung and then, then dies and the body cases it off and you get a similar looking nodule to what you see here. Although the, the rare cases I've seen, the worm was like a degenerated kind of necrotic fragment of worm, but it's surrounded by a very similar ball of fibrosis, inflammation, fibrinoid necrosis, and granuloma. So that is another thing I've seen that looked maybe a little similar. And I'm sure that there are a variety of other um, uh, worm or filarial uh, type processes that could cause a similar um, a reaction pattern from the human body. All right, case number eight is a shave biopsy. And I like this one because it shows two lesions. And uh, this disease is Veruca plana or flat warts. And so Veruca plana are much more subtle than Veruca vulgaris. Veruca vulgaris have the, the prominent papillomatosis with finger-like projections and tears of perikeratosis in intoing of the reedy. And if you need a refresher on that, I've got a very long uh, in-depth video about Veruca, and I've also got a short video about Veruca. I'll put links to those down below. You can go check it out. But Veruca plana look quite different. They're very subtle, and they're easy to misdiagnose if you're not familiar with them. Uh, but what you see is a kind of subtle acanthosis. The epidermis is a little thicker than normal to the side. There is subtle, vague papillomatosis, but it's kind of more of a gentle rolling or undulating, little hills rather than finger-like projections. And in those areas of acanthosis and undulating subtle papillomatosis, you will see very prominent enlarged 
vacuolated keratinocytes. So the nuclei get large and they get pale, pale or clear cytoplasm around them. So these are coilocytes, but they are kind of a different, unique pattern of coilocyte that you that you see in in uh, flatworts in Veruca plana, and uh, they are usually abundant and uh, present all through the upper spinous layer and the granular layer here. And uh, not for coilocytes, and my long Veruca video goes in, in depth on this and shows you many examples of coilocytes. But for coilocytes, I don't care just about seeing pale or clear cytoplasm. I want to see large nuclei plus usually pale or clear cytoplasm. But the nuclei get kind of paradoxically enlarged as they approach the granular layer when they're HPV infected cells, as opposed to normal keratinocytes, which start getting smaller and smaller as they get towards the top of the granular layer. All right, so these cells, some people have called bird's eye cells. I don't know that birds have eyeballs that look like this, but in any case, bird's eye cells are the type of kind of pale uh, coilocyte that you see in Veruca plana. And then of course, you'll see also hypergranulosis, which is a characteristic feature of, of you know, all types of Veruca and uh, HPV driven uh, warts. So this is uh, Veruca plana, and here we have one lesion of it. And then over here, we have kind of more normal-ish epidermis and then another Veruca plana. And so the reason this is nice and the, oh, the bird's eye cells, the coilocytes are even better here, right? The reason this is helpful is that Veruca plana are often present as multiple lesions either grouped together in the same area or present in a linear fashion along a site of previous excoriation or trauma. Or, you know, like trauma, people sometimes will get this where they shave, you know, with the razor blade and they shave and that tracks the virus along the skin at an area that kind of uh, erodes or damages the skin from the razor blade kind of, you know, uh, shaving off the top part of skin. And then the viral, uh, the viral organisms contaminate that area and then start growing in it and make a linear uh, pattern. So that pattern is called Kebnerization. The Kebner phenomenon is when you have any sort of a process that tracks along a site of previous trauma. And it's a, a classically seen in a variety of different entities, but one of those entities is Veruca plana. So they often are present as multiple lesions associated closely with one another. So if you get a big enough shave biopsy, you can sometimes see two or, or even three or four uh, a little tiny foci of Veruca plana in the same biopsy. So I think that's a nice on this shave here because it uh, drives home that point. So the, the last thing I wanted to make uh, or tell you about Veruca plana is that when the coilocytes, if the coilocytes are a little bit more subtle, sometimes Veruca plana can look a lot like lichen simplex chronicus or paragonodularis, which is basically both the same thing, just a difference clinically. But those are reactive thickening of the skin uh, from chronic scratching, rubbing, itching, or, or irritation. The, the epidermis gets acanthotic, hypergranulosis, uh, hyperkeratosis, mostly ortho, but sometimes a little para. And all of those things together, especially if you get a little artificial vacuolation of the cells, LSC can get papillomatosis, subtle papillomatosis. I've seen that many times on top of lichen simplex chronicus and paragonodularis. So I, I often struggle with, uh, if I see something that I know the patient's been scratching at and it looks like LSC or parigo, but there's some subtle papillomatosis, sometimes I wonder if there could maybe be a pre-existing wart and I'll add a comment that you know, there could possibly be an underlying Veruca that was pre-existent that the patient then has, has been scratching and itching, but I can't tell for sure. So sometimes if I'm not sure, I'll add a comment like that. But just know that, um, that if you struggle telling LSC apart from Veruca plana, so do I sometimes. And I'm, uh, I'm not sure, especially if I don't have good clinical information. So that's one uh, differential. But other than that, really, this is a pretty, um, pretty distinct appearance if you've got a well-developed example. So that's nice. Uh, Veruca plana, and here's more of it up here. On the right, we got one, and on the left, there, this is a nice example of how subtle they can be. See, if you have that, I mean, that's only just very vague thickening, very vague hypergranulosis, subtle little bird's eye coilocytes. So, on ones like this, sometimes I'll say it's suggestive of Veruca plana. I'm not 100% sure. So, um, uh, maybe, uh, maybe some people say that you should always be black and white, but I'd rather be honest and be gray sometimes and say, I'm just not 100% sure on this case. And I'd rather be honest with my dermatologists. And uh, uh, that's just the way that I do things. All right, now let's move on to case nine. We have an anthill-like uh, structure here. It looks like myromucial wart right off the bat. But when we, when we look closer, this thick epidermis here, we can see uh, all these inclusions. So 
it's kind of reddish, almost like dark purple like inclusions here that also make us think of uh, Marmesia Ward. Yeah, very good. It's a perfect Marmesia Ward. Like once you've seen it, you recognize it right away. I think a few things that uh, can be confusing to people with Mermisia wort is number one, figuring out which way is up. And this is true of any palm art or plant art wort. They have a tendency, whether or not they have the Mermisia, the, the, the inclusion like uh, structures of Mermisia wort or they're just regular. But they, they often have uh, really abundant papillomatosis, but they're kind of uh, sunken down below the surface level of the skin. So like here, the skin surface would be like, like at this level that I'm drawing across here. So like if the, the epidermis, if we had it, would be like about here. And then now we have this invagination, this kind of cup-shaped invagination. And the, the, the finger-like projections sit down in that cup. So number one, if you're doing a shave biopsy of an acral wart, try to get as deep as you can. Because a lot of times what I'll get is just corneal layer, maybe with some granules or hepera over top. And I could say this could be the surface of a veruca, but I really can't see any epidermis if I just get like this stuff up here, right? Could that be the top of a squam, squamous cell carcinoma? Yeah, sure, it could. If it's a young patient, I'm not really worried about that. But an older adult, you know, I, I'm not always sure. Um, sometimes if I can see the mermesia uh, inclusions, then it's pretty obvious that we're dealing with a mermesia wart. Um, also, usually if I see large atypical nuclei in perikeratosis, I get worried about an underlying unsampled squamous cell carcinoma. But one major exception is warts, particularly mermesia warts or other palmar plantar warts. They can get pretty weird, funky looking perikeratosis over them, the kind that you would see over top of a squamous cell carcinoma elsewhere in the body, but it's just over the top of a veruca. So, um, but otherwise, if I'm seeing like big dark nuclei that are dead in the perikeratosis, I get uh, elsewhere in the body, like, you know, on the face of an older person, I get very concerned that there's an un underlying unsampled squamous cell carcinoma. And I'll usually say it's atypical perikeratosis, but, um, and uh, ask for a deeper biopsy. But here in an acral site in a younger person, I feel okay with that, especially if we see the big blobs of inclusion. Okay, so the other features, uh, you know, when we look down below, um, Oh, is it going to freeze up? Okay, there we go. You're going to see the intoing, the reedy pointing towards the middle, the papillomatosis of the epidermis, the dilated capillaries in the papillary dermis usually. You will see hypergranulosis with big, dark purple granules. And then you'll also, in Mermesia, see these like kind of reddish purple, um, chunky inclusions. And that's thought to be a, a conglomeration of viral particles. At least that's the way I've learned it. Um, okay, so the, what else could mimic this? The, the one other, uh, the two other things I sometimes see people get confused about is that they think this looks a little bit like molluscum or they think it looks a little bit like epidermolytic hyperkeratosis, okay? So I think the warty shape is the most helpful thing off the bat, that that's for Veruca. Also, the vast majority of Mermesia Veruca type, uh, Mermesia type Veruca that I've seen are on acral skin. I've rarely seen them at other places. I think I saw one on the elbow, which is kind of almost like acral skin, if you think about it. I've seen one on the eyebrow once, but usually the 99% of them I see on the palm or sole, okay, or, or fingers, toes, okay? And uh, um, molluscum I, is usually in hair-bearing skin because uh, it seems to kind of involve like hair follicle epithelium, I think. And I don't think I've ever seen molluscum on the palms or soles, so the sight right away will help you. And then EHK can look a little bit like, oh, the, the other thing, molluscum, the, the inclusions, the Henderson-Patterson bodies do look a bit like this, but they are much more uniform in size and shape, whereas you get ones of all different size here in Mermesium, tiny ones, little ones, medium ones, and big, huge ones all together uh, kind of chaotically in the Mermesia ward. So I have a whole video about Mermesia and molluscum and how to tell those apart. And I also have videos about epidermolytic hyperkeratosis, which can have some like chunky aggregates like this, but will have more clear cell change in the keratinocytes and will not usually have a warty surface unless it's a acanthoma, in which case it could look a little bit like this. So those are kind of three things you could put in the differential together. And again, I've got videos and examples of those on my Kiko index that you guys can check out. So Veruca, um, palma plantar veruca, uh, mermesia type. And mermesia comes from the Greek word for ant. Case 10. Okay, so um, 
from low power here, there's the punch, there's a few things going through my mind. Um, you know, I'm seeing, I'm almost wondering if there's like a granulomatous component with like the east-west, um, like light purple cells up in the um, papillary dermis. You know, just like a tuberculoid leprosy. Um, I'm also seeing some inflammation down, um, you know, the hair follicles. So then that kind of makes me think, you know, just like a maybe like a tumid lupus or neutrophilic enterocarditis. Um, but you can also see that the hair follicles are at least the one on the right here is pretty um, necrotic. Yes. It's like it's dying, and um, going in even closer, you can kind of start seeing um, how a lot of these cells have those three M's to them. Yeah, a couple in here. Um, They're mostly dead, so it's hard to see the viral change, but you can see kind of the margination, uh, maybe a touch of molding here and there. And then here, these are like the viral cells that are dead, right? And they're acantholytic and separated apart. So you kind of, sometimes you have to like kind of look through all the mess and death to try to see the herpes change. But that's where right away you recognize the clue, right? It's dead. So the answer then is, sorry, I, yeah. I cut you yeah, off. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would say it's either herpes um, simplex or zoster, and because it's involving the follicles, I think you would favor more of a zoster. Yeah, very good. So uh, follicular and particularly sebaceous gland necrosis uh, and look, it's dirty necrosis with neutrophils and fragments of nuclear debris here. Just that same kind of necrosis in the epidermis, we think of herpes. If you see that around the necrotic hair follicle or sebaceous gland right away, to me, that's like herpes until I prove otherwise, uh, because it's a really good clue for herpes. And like you said, herpes um, involving the hair follicle tends to be more common in, in varicella zoster um, than in simplex. Um, the cytopathic change is the same, but the idea is that the, in zoster, the, the VZV, a herpes virus from the dorsal root sensory ganglion, reactivates, spreads out through the sensory nerves. And the theory that some have had is that it may travel up the nerves to the root of a hair follicle, and that's why the follicles can sometimes get infected first before infection of the overlying epidermis. Because look, here... The epidermis is totally normal. I mean, well, a little bit of sponge or reactive change, but no blister, no necrosis, no viral change. If you just had a shave biopsy, we would have no idea this was herpes. So it's a good thing to know about and to think about that if you don't have vesicular lesions yet and you're thinking about herpes zoster from the clinical appearance, a punch biopsy may serve you well trying to get around some follicular openings because like in this case, a shave would miss the diagnosis, okay? The other thing I've noticed before in herpes is, like you pointed out, and I love that, that you pointed out, brisk, superficial, and deep perivascular inflammation, like the kind of inflammation you'd see in lupus or the, in other diseases. So, um, and in that case, even though the infiltrate in the, around the follicle and around the blister and necrosis of the epidermis usually has neutrophils in it, I often see lymphohistiocytic infiltrate without neutrophils around the vessels in herpes. And we sometimes don't pay attention to this because we get focused on the viral change, which of course is important. But do keep that in mind if there, if you don't see the other changes of herpes, but there's a clinical suspicion and you see superficial and deep lymphocytic infiltrate, cut deeper, go looking for herpes. I've seen lichenoid infiltrate that on deepers ended up being herpes. I've seen necrotic ulcers that if I look carefully at the edge or did deepers, I found herpes. I've heard reports rarely of like leukocytoclastic vasculitis or perivascular infiltrate only that was positive for herpes on PCR. Um, I don't, I've not recognized the case of that yet in my practice, although perhaps I've overlooked it uh, because those can be challenging. So uh, always be aware of herpes. And a lot of times now you guys are doing the PCR right off the bat if you have a suspicion for it. But sometimes herpes can have a sneaky presentation and not be suspected. Um, uh, and I've seen cases like that. So uh, follicular necrosis is very good for VZV. And again, here, that, that pattern of necrotic keratinocytes even though I can't see the good the good uh, nuclear changes, that is herpes until proven otherwise. And if you can't find an area that's convincing, do the immunostain, and it'll usually light up this stuff even if it's necrotic. So usually the uh, herpes, if you have to use the immunostain, the immunostain is usually pretty strongly positive and, and is very 
uh, helpful if you are in doubt. All right. So herpetic folliculitis, more common in varicella zoster. 11. So we have a very thin shade, um, somewhat like atrophic appearing epidermis. Stratum cordium looks a little bit thickened in certain areas, which is probably like where I would zoom in first. But <laughs> <laughs> looking at this, this looks like normal skin for the most part. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of areas don't look too exciting. Maybe a little bit of like sponge. Like I, at low power, I might think of like sponge derm that's been scratched a little bit, you know? That would be my thought. And like you said, zooming in though is the key. If I was here, if I was just over here, I'd think sponge derm with some neutrophils, maybe it's dermatophyte, maybe tinea, you know? There's some EOs, could be contact derm with impetigenization, could be dermatophyte, it would depend on the clinical, but really sponge derm with some EOs and neutrophils would be my first thought until jackpot. So what have we here? Oop. Yeah, there is this brown, you know, globules here are scabies poop, scabies feces or scabala, if we want a fancier, uh, more genteel sort of name. And a, a scabies organism right next to it, I think that is probably a mite or it could be an egg. I can't tell for sure from here. It's unfortunately right under the fold, which seems to be the case when you have the best thing and then it's under the fold in the tissue, which is maddening. But a great reminder of look how focal the scabies can be. This whole big strip here, and there's the one area on the one section. So this is why clinically, if you think about scabies, please do a scraping, mineral oil or KOH if you prefer. I like the mineral oil because you can see them swimming around still, which is delightful and disturbing at the same time. Um, and you know, it, it, if you know, on biopsy, it's kind of a matter of getting lucky. I have many times over the years tried to do deepers looking for scabies. And, and when they're, and it almost never has panned out for me. So I don't know if, if we should do that or not. I, I usually, if I think it could be scabies or if I see sponge derm and EOs or arthropod bite reaction type pattern and there's a clinical concern for scabies or I think it could be scabies, I'll mention in a comment, scabies can produce this pattern of inflammation, but I don't see any mites and in the examined sections or scabala or eggs. And, um, and so I recommend then correlation with the skin scraping or even empiric treatment for scabies if there's concern clinically that it could be that. So I like to you know keep scabies in mind. It's possible we could have one or two other burrows over here, but I didn't see any mites or eggs in those um, when I looked at this case uh, last night. I think this was the best area. And sometimes the scabala is all you have. And if you polarize, you can sometimes see little fragments of polarizable stuff in the scabala, just like you can see little polarizable spines on the, the surface of the of the mite itself. So scabies. And sometimes the inflammation is subtle. Sometimes it's very robust. Sometimes there are very few EOs. Sometimes there's tons of EOs. Uh, Sarah Shalin and I um, uh, wrote a paper about that a long time ago. And uh, one finding that she had noticed is that sometimes you see thrombi in the dermis under scabies. And in fact, when we went back and looked at our past cases, we found that in 20, 20 or percent or more of cases had thrombi. So interesting um, uh, finding that you can see under scabies is uh, dermal luminal thrombi sometimes. Case 12. So not all that dissimilar from the orc case. Um, yeah. But here, yep, it's less of a discrete papule. Um, again, looks like a lot of papillary dermal edema. And then um, up higher in the epidermis, like stratum spinosum um, and granular layer, we are getting more of that ballooning degeneration type change. Um, swollen cells, they're very rounded up. Um, so this doesn't have quite the right look for like the HSV, VZV type cytopathic change. Um, so we're getting less of those 4M features and more of just the swollen, rounded up um, degenerative change. So um, kind of an interesting differential on this one. It could include ORF, but less consistent without that papule change. Yeah. Um, but you could also consider like papular purpuric gloves and socks syndrome. Good. Um, yeah, which would typically be Parvo B19, but there are a couple other viruses that can cause that as well. And then I think the other big differential is hand, foot, and mouth on this one. Excellent. And I love that you thought of parvovirus gloves and socks. I've only seen one case that we thought really did fit for that clinically. And I think they, I think they did a 
blood test in that case? I want to say that it was confirmed actually by either serology or PCR. It was a long time ago, but I've seen it only once. And it did kind of have this look. This, this in this case, was clinically hand, foot, mouth, you know, which will be, you know, painful papules or pustules on the hands and or feet and also the mouth. And also sometimes I've heard that the buttock is a good site, even though it's not, uh, not classically in the name, but that uh, it can be on the buttock. And so I think that your differential is great, uh, Kate. And I like that you brought up that, you know, this has the general viral appearance. And I don't know exactly how to put it in words. It is kind of a gestalt, but the ballooning degeneration or reticular degeneration where the epidermis gets, the, the keratinocytes get pale, expanded cytoplasm and pale nuclei and begin to die. And then the epidermis kind of strings out and gets all this spongy or edema-like space in between, between strands of dead and dying pale keratinocytes, what we call the pale change we call ballooning degeneration. These stranding and falling apart we call reticular degeneration or kind of vesicular-like change. And that mixture together, especially with dermal edema and perivascular, all of that makes me think of virus in general, but particularly I would think of it with, yeah, either paro, paro gloves and socks, or if it were multiple papules on the hand um, or mouth, I would think of, uh, of hand, foot, mouth disease from Coxsackie virus, right? And so um, even if I, otherwise I would just even suggest other viral etiology could be there. You could think about herpes. You could do the stain if you weren't sure, but I agree with you that I don't see any good herpes type 3M or 4M, you know, multinucleation molding margination here. But this was a nice case of hand, foot, mouth. And I, I feel like the really dramatic papillary dermal edema and hemorrhage too is a really good finding uh, that we really do see a lot in hand, foot, mouth. But I would say early ORF could probably look like this. I've never, I've like I said, only seen one biopsy of ORF and it was a really dramatic kind of uh, more pronounced case. But I would imagine from the clinical photos that early ORF could have similar appearances microscopically. And see here, look, the ballooning change is kind of just starting out in scattered apoptotic cells here. And on the other side, we see the more kind of advanced uh, uh, ballooning and reticular degeneration. So nice case. And I've got a couple other cases and videos of hand, foot, mouth on, on my uh, index on Kiko. I'll try to link those down below. All right, case 13. Okay. I'll take this one. So from here, you can see in the dermis, you have these uh, cystic looking collections. Well, they may or may not connect to the surface in another cut, but when you go on higher power, you can see they're filled with these kind of bright eosinophilic inclusions that are slowly coming into focus. <laughs> slowly getting there. And they have a really nice name. Yeah. There they are. So the only one thing that's going to be looks like the Henderson Patterson bodies of molluscum. Absolutely. Henderson Patterson bodies, molluscum bodies, these pink kind of uniform, granular looking aggregates of viral particle that are expanding the cytoplasm of the keratinocytes and eventually getting sloughed off into the, uh, into the, the keratin, uh, either on the surface of the skin, that'd be the stratum corneum or here, the cyst contents. And I love that you pointed out, these look like a cyst, right? But remember that if you have a cup shaped thing, like molluscum is an umbilicated papule with a kind of cup shaped central depression, when they get really kind of cup shaped, they can be a cystic. And it's just a matter of if you cut, get a section right through the center of one of those papules, it's going to look like a cup shaped invagination of the epidermis. But if you cut just to the side of it a little bit, it's going to look like one or more cysts in the dermis. If we do deeper sections, these will connect to the surface. So I often see molluscum with a cystic kind of pattern. And I think that confuses people at first. They don't think that about molluscum having this change. Sometimes also this pattern can happen where you've got a cyst with very little of the molluscum change in the wall of the cyst, but nice Henderson-Patterson bodies in the cyst contents. And sometimes they are very sparse. So that's good to think about. Here you can see, look, like one subtle molluscum change there. Also, on depending on where your section is, you might see just the subtlest hint of keratinocytes that are getting large and kind of an expanded pink cytoplasm. What Dr. Hafiz Dewan, one of my mentors from Houston, he's at, at currently at Baylor, um, College of Medicine, and he um, says that these are the pregnant seahorse sign. They're like the, the, the male seahorse with that large pouch, or I guess the female seahorse that's pregnant either way, but the seahorse with the distended belly, and he always comes up with these fun names for uh, different microscopic signs in derm path, um, and he's hilarious. Really, really wonderful educator and really funny uh, comedian, in my opinion. But I like his point because the, the, the nuclei and 
uh, the cell itself of the keratinocyte in, in molluscum is way bigger. Look at these guys here, or girls, I don't know which. And then look at normal epidermis here. People get, we see the Henderson-Patterson bodies and then we think of nothing else because it's benign and beautiful, even though it can be pretty morbid and frustrating for patients and their family members um, who have had to deal with molluscum because it, it can take a long time to go away, as you guys all know. But a lot of times we don't really focus on how very different the cytology is of these keratinocytes. And the reason I point this out is I saw a case a long time ago where the it was a, a kid and the cells were big and someone had thought they were worried about squamous cell carcinoma, even though they said it's crazy because this person's a teenager, it doesn't make sense, but these are atypical keratinocytes. And then when I saw the case, I thought it somehow reminds me of molluscum and we got the block and cut deeper and Henderson-Patterson bodies showed up. But it without seeing the Henderson-Patterson bodies, the keratinocytes, in contrast to normal, were atypical. So I think that is a normal, totally normal feature of molluscum. In fact, it's a, it's a feature, not a bug, so to speak. So keep that in mind that the keratinocytes can get really big and expanded. Oh, even better. Look at that view there. Those are the, how big and large those keratinocytes are that are virally infected. Virally infected keratinocytes from lots of different viruses, they get big. They look weird. Even in Veruca, we often see kind of atypical looking keratinocytes in Veruca. I feel like often I see that. And that can be a problem in sun damaged skin. So uh, where it can make it mimic squamous cell carcinoma. Anyway, cystic molluscum uh, with Henderson batters and bodies. And I've got more uh, videos and posts about that online. So you can check it out. And also remember that molluscum can be very inflamed, especially when it ruptures. And the inflammation can be so dense that it mimics lymphoma. I've seen cases where we actually you know, thought about it and, and started working it up for lymphoma. And then on the deeper cuts, when we did the immunostains, there was molluscum body. So I've seen it so robust as the mimic uh, lymphoma. It, it can really be a tricky diagnosis. So if you're thinking about it, cut deeper is looking for molluscum. Case 14. That's a so, beauty. This is again a very nice one. So we don't see any skin over here. Nope. We just see an organism. Yep. Which is a thick. Uh, it has like this pigmented mouth parts. Uh, and we can see striated muscles. Yeah. Tightness wall around. Kind of cool, huh? Yeah, so this is a, a, a tick. The mouth parts would be down here. The body kind of protruding up here. This is probably a section of one of its legs with like a little claw or, you know, pincher on the end. I don't know what the proper term is. And I've always been fascinated. It's like a world within a world, right? It's like, uh, you know, a, the microanatomy of a tick. And these are skeletal muscle. And their skeletal muscle has peripheral nuclei just like ours. Isn't that wild? It's so crazy. And then what's all this stuff? organs inside here like look if that cell were in our body that nucleus as a, if you took it as a ratio to the cross section of the body that nucleus would be like the size of a, a baseball or a ping pong ball or something it would be cancer in a human body but it seems to just be normal in the tick and i've often wondered what all these things are and i i got went down a rabbit hole last night looking for this there is surprisingly little that I could find of H&E sections of tick with an explanation of the microanatomy. So if you're watching this online and you know um, a good resource, please um, post a link to it. That would be great. Um, but I did find this schematic, and it was a uh, entomology, a tick dissection guide, which is from the uh, Mississippi Entomological Association. I'll put a link below. It's freely available online on uh, their website, and it's a beautiful uh, example of a schematic here showing that a lot of the stuff we're seeing inside probably is gut and salivary gland and maybe there are some ovaries or, or um, gonadal structures and then also the, um, the uh, skeletal muscle which is the only structure I can really recognize and they show how to glue the tick down and peel off its uh, scutum and look at all isn't that wild so crazy so uh, anyway go check that out if you're looking how to dissect a tick and if you can tell me what all these different things are microscopically, that would be great. I've got another uh, post on Kiko that shows a, another view of a cross-section of a tick. But I think a lot of these are going to be digestive tract and maybe some salivary gland and some muscle, skeletal muscle in there. And uh, I kind of wonder if that's like a brain structure. Some entomologists out there will watch us and be like, oh, bro, no, definitely not. But there is something called like a central ganglion, which I think is like the equivalent of a brain. I don't know. Pretty wild, huh? 
So anyway, tick, and that's that yellow chitin right there that we see in the embedded mouth part. So a lot of times all we see is this stuff right here embedded down in the skin, but every time, once in a while we get lucky and get a whole tick submitted, and I always think it's fun to submit that just because it's a pretty section to look at. So tick microanatomy uh, right here, and again, look at that jagged kind of um, geometric lines or linear structures that you see in the um, exoskeleton. You can see similar kind of uh, shape in, in um, scabies mites, but this is way too big to be a scabies mite. Number 15. Thankfully, we've got a dot sign to help us here. Yes, the dot sign is very valuable. <laughs> so basically, so, I'll cut to the chase. Inflamed ulcer with a lot of edema and granulation tissue. And then what do we see at the, the dot since I'm running short on time because of my verbosity? Yeah, I think we see some large uh, endothelial cells here with like almost very little cytoplasm. Yeah. So kind of like rem uh, reminds you of those algae in Christian body. Yeah. Of, um, CMV. Yeah, you can, there's a dot like, you know, nucleolus or a viral inclusion. You sometimes it's hard to tell which, but, but it's really a poor scan, so we can't see it. But massive big nucleus here, right at the vessel wall. And then looking around, you can see there are more of the same, like right here. So yeah, this is cytomegalovirus. I think this is one that kind of is almost like an owl eye uh, look, but I wish it was a better scan. I have not recognize the case of this yet in practice. Um, it is, I think, relatively rare. Um, even, and I've seen quite a few immunocompromised patients who would be candidates for this and have looked for this before, but I've, I've not uh, yet d diagnosed the case. CMV, the most common cell type it affects is the endothelial cell. So looking around the vessels is gonna be your best bet. And then you can use the CMV immunostain um, uh, to confirm uh, that those are CMV, uh, if there's any doubt. They're, they can occasionally infect other cell types, but the most most likely cell type usually is, is going to be the endothelial cells. So, so spend time looking around the vessels, and if in doubt, you can you could add on um, an immunostain uh, for CMV, cytomegalovirus, uh, which is a member of the human herpes virus uh, family, right? Just like Epstein-Barr. And HSV and VZV, they're all kind of related in that same family. Here's another one out here. So pretty good example. Um, maybe I'll go see if I can dig up this slide out of the teaching set and do a rescan um, and uh, try to do that. So that, I'll put that on my to-do list and uh, we'll see if it gets done. Good job. Case 16. All right, here we have a shave with... Um some good ballooning degeneration of keratinocytes here uh, and what looks to be like a vesicle, um, you know, almost full thickness in the epidermis, but not quite. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, as we look closer, we can see um, some larger cells, mega, some, some uh, multinucleation, um, some margination, uh, all makes good for like a HSV. Yeah, this is really, really good um, cytology. Even with the lower quality scan, you can see good margination, dark border of the nucleus, the nucleus smashed against and molding against the neighboring keratinocyte nuclei. Five or six nuclei clustered together in one cell here, and they're all way bigger. Look at those. And then let's go look at some normal over here skin. So just like we said with the molluscum, look, normal size. And then way, they're starting to get way bigger. So the, the mega, the fourth M, good job. And acantholysis, right? The cells are falling apart and rounding up. When, when the cells lose connection with their neighbors, the keratinocytes, they round up. And that's how we know it's really acantholysis rather than just regular spongiosis, uh, for example. So I find oftentimes the edge, the periphery of the blister or the ulcer is where I'm more likely to find intact, viable uh, keratinocytes with uh, cytopathic uh, HSV or VZV herpes cytopathic effect. Look, dying keratinocytes, kind of mimicking um, a vacuolar interface here a little bit. So that again, remember that you can sometimes have uh, dying keratinocytes and interface change in herpes. And um, also dirty necrosis, I find that really helpful either in a blister 
with acantholysis or even just an open ulcer with no blister roof because a lot of times the, the they ulcerate by the time they're biopsied. So I'd say it's only a minority of cases I get that have this beautiful intact and necrotic blister roof. You can see the whole blister roof is dead and is composed of necrotic cells with herpes viral effect. You're seeing the ghost of them, right? And sometimes you can see like, nucle like a nuclear inclusion. I feel like sometimes I see that better in the dead uh, nuclear, like a, a reddish dot in the middle. But here's more viral change. Really nice example of herpes. Okay, 17. Okay, so um, even from low power, you can see this pretty impressive cutaneous horn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then at the base is um, kind of the papillomatous acanthotic epidermis. Um, so, you know, when I see cutaneous horn, you can think of a few different things, you know, Sevcare, AK, um, Veruca, um, and uh, Squame. Yeah, exactly. So, That's the top four things to make a horn. Very good. Yeah. So, I mean, just here with the, the really long tiers of hair care, um, I personally didn't see too much atypia in the epidermis. Um, right. Agree. So I was more fingering Veruca. Yeah, I agree. But I like that you brought up, I mean, squamous cell carcinoma can have a very verrucous appearance. And of course, you know, the only way to know what's causing a horn is to biopsy and get the base of it. Otherwise, if I just get this, I say it's, it's a cutaneous horn, but we have to see the base of it. Now, almost certainly it's going to be because of a Veruca when I can see the blood in those spires of para with blood in the middle, that corresponds to the dilated capillaries that are commonly present in the, the dermal papillae inside these papillary finger-shaped structures of the epidermis. So this is papillomatosis, finger-shaped projection of epidermis. And then these are the dermal papillae that are getting caught and pulled up in there. And they often have very dilated blood vessels. And those vessels tend to bleed and hemorrhage out into um, the, the stratum corneum. And then that blood gets trapped. And that's what those black dots are on the surface of a wart that you can see clinically that some, you know, non-medical folks will call seeds. They think it's a seed wart because I think that because of plantar wart got confused with planter, like planting in the ground. And then they thought it's a seed. That's the story I like to tell myself of how that, that name came up. But it's, it's, uh, people are right for the wrong reason, right? These are contagious and they are kind of, there's a viral seed. It's just not the blood. The blood, the black dots is just blood. So anyway, that's a really good feature for Veruca. And then also we have this kind of invagination. Sometimes warts are kind of endophytic, or in this case, exophytic and endophytic at the same time. They're above the skin surface, but then down in a cup. So kind of the opposite way that we see in, you know, like acryl, uh, you know, palmar or plantar warts. And we have nice intoing, the reedy point in towards the middle, the dilated vessels, the tears of para, the chunky coalesced blobs of dark purple hypergranulosis. Those are all excellent features for Veruca. And then a nice cutaneous horn over the top. Perfect. And I've got videos about horns and Veruca. I'll put links down below if you're watching this online. Okay, so I have this one. Okay. Ugh. Looks like a claw. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Like a lobster claw, you're right. Yeah. Um, so as it's coming into focus, um, I kind of, like, when I saw this one, honestly, from far, I was like, well, what is this? Very yeah. Pink. Um, didn't really look like skin. Maybe it shouldn't be in this collection. And then when you kind of zoom in, you see this sort of, like, muscular wall to it. Um, that's how I think of it. And then all this good stuff over here yeah <laughs> uh -huh, exactly um so this is good for my eyes that's like this yes looking thing very good this is this is bot fly larva a maggot of the bot fly or myiasis and it gets you get bit by the or the fly lays its egg in the skin uh of the patient and then that develops hatches and develops into this little wriggly worm that um is normally that uh this larva it's not really a worm i misspoke it is a larva a maggot and um and it normally would sit in this cavity here and then has a little breathing tube up to the skin surface so when they're removed if you excise that um that whole uh 
the, the larva with the encasing area of basically scar and granulation tissue and fibrosis all around here. So this is basically like a pseudocyst with a massive amount of inflammation and granulation tissue, which isn't coming into focus, but you can trust me, it's there even from, from low power, we see the shape of it. So that by itself, we would just say, well, it's a, it could be a ruptured cyst, it could be a lot of things, an abscess cavity, hydradenitis suppurativa, you know, pilonidal sinus tract, all that stuff could look just like this here. But then here, there's a little bit of the, uh, the a little fragment with, um, with uh, chitin in it, that yellowish refractile carbohydrate, the chitin right there. And then what's happened is that after this was removed, the, uh, the bot fly larva popped out. And it has, a, I don't, again, I don't know what the microanatomy is here, but I do feel like the microanatomy, even though the size is about right for a tick, it would have been coming from that cavity, whereas ticks are always up on the surface and only their mouth parts are in the skin. These guys are underneath the skin, down deep in the dermis, or even like in this case, in the subcutis probably. And they've got lots of muscle. All this is skeletal muscle here. And I do feel from the a couple of cases I've seen in recut collections, that their, their pink and yellow chitin of their um, exoskeleton is very like wavy and undulating. And I think that makes sense if you just think of like a regular fly larva. They have like like really bulging ridges on them. And I think that that's my theory is that that's what this is recapitulating. I've never actually seen a bot fly larva in person. Um, but uh, I think that this, this really undulating look is kind of characteristic of the bot flies that I've seen. And then again, you have these little nubs of pink or yellow chitin and then a bunch of muscle and whatever these weird things, these huge cells are here. I don't know what those are. Is, it G, is that a breathing tubule there? I don't know. It's a mystery. If you're an entomologist, please let me know. And then, of course, the huge reaction. So that's the bot fly. Case 19 into focus um but this one's so classic even with the blurriness you can um form a differential so it looks like we've got these cross sections of what i imagine would be a very fleshy pedunculated papule clinically um we do have areas of some more compact stratum corneum acanthosis and then um when you do go closer you start seeing areas that have more of the rounded perikeratosis and some coarse hypergranulosis. So that all supports more of like a condyloma, um, but Good. it also can carry like formerly papulosis in the differential. It would want to look for atypia. Yeah, right. That's good to think of uh, whenever you see a condyloma, always think about could there be um, higher grade atypia or what we would now call uh, H cell high, high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion which has a few forms, Bowen's disease or squamous in situ, and I kind of lump Bowenoid papulosis under that category of h cell. Personally, that's my view. Uh, it's kind of a somewhat controversial terminology nowadays, but uh, in any case, uh, yes, uh, I think this area from low power, you could definitely think of a large uh, separate keratosis would be the one other big differential I'd have, depending on where it was from. This is quite polypoid, and if this it looks like this and it's from the anogenital area, almost it's condyloma till proven otherwise um if it has this you know such a papillomatous uh warty uh shape i think the areas that you know if you just had that though that looks a lot like a separate keratosis to me and uh sometimes especially like in the other fold sets of the axilla i i've seen separate keratoses plenty of times that looked like this but the things that really help me aside from the site uh, in clinical impression is areas like this where you get kind of a more knuckled, rounded and smoothed, rounded papillomatosis rather than the, the pointed finger-shaped papillomatosis of a conventional Veruca, a regular wart, Veruca vulgaris. This is a, a genital wart, condyloma cuminatum, tends to have these more rounded uh, areas. And then in these areas, you'll often see, like you said, perikeratosis that's kind of coming off of rounded cells. Um, the, uh, which also gives you that, that viral feel like you'd see these little tufts of para like you'd see in a regular wart. And then also the best thing to me is I want to find coilocytes. I, you do not need coilocytes for a regular Veruca vulgaris and not all condylomas have them. But if I have any doubt, I really like to see coilocytes in a condyloma just because it can be a stigmatizing diagnosis because it's a sexually transmitted infection and can, can sometimes create significant social issues to diagnose condyloma. You know, maybe in a monogamous, you know, relationship where the person, um, you know, has not had a previous history of that. You know, so I do try to be mindful of that, even though it is uh, not a malignant disease. It is a disease that can 
come with a significant amount of of, of social uh, stigma and can potentially cause problems. You never know the life situation of a patient. So I feel like I really try to be, you know, as, as you know, objective as I can with these. And I really want to see good coilocytes. Or if not, you can use, um, uh, you can use insight to hybridization for HPV if there's a doubt. And then also, like I said, or like you brought up, I do look for atypia here. But those are nice coilocytes. They are large nuclei, pale nuclei pale cytoplasm and in the upper stratum corneum or granular layer, <clears throat> usually near the areas where the parakeratosis is coming from. I don't care about just little vacuolated keratinocytes. I want to see big nuclei with pale cytoplasm. All right, that's what I want for a good, um, a good example of HPV viral effect, like right, right there. Well, we saw it already. We don't have time to wait for it to focus. And again, I've got a Veruca video that has more uh, uh, examples of like perfect coilocytes. So condyloma cumina. All right, case 20. That contrast to that last one, not quite as pedunculated. There is some like acanthosis of the epidermis that's very blue from here. Yeah. Um, and these areas over here are very tangential, which is why they look so weird with all those islands. So this area is a little bit better orientation. We'll try to get it to come into focus. So aside from being thick, what else is wrong with the epidermis? Like compared to, you know, kind of more normal over here. So it's not really maturing. There's a lot of right. blue cells throughout it. So kind of more full thickness. Yeah. Very like, blue. Yeah, more so, yeah blue. Right. Good. So full thickness blue in the epidermis, especially in aneogenital sites, right away I think of H-cell or elsewhere in the skin, subtle squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Uh, in the anogenital area, I don't call it squamous situ. I call it high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, open parenth H cell. And then I add a comment because not everybody in the OB-GYN literature, people in the field of OB-GYN, people are familiar with that terminology because that's where it originated. I find that not everyone in the dermatology world, depending on when they trained, is, is familiar with that. So I usually add a comment that this is basically the, the current name for HPV-driven, high-risk HPV-driven high-grade dysplasia or squamous cell carcinoma in situ of the anogenital area. And the the difference of whether it's squamous in situ or what would be called Bowen's disease in the past or Bowenoid papulosis is really clinical. And again, it's kind of controversial, I guess, in modern times. Not everyone agrees with the term Bowenoid papulosis, but I think there are uh, people in dermatology that still believe that's a separate entity and that basically it'll be younger people, they have HPV and they get multiple, often pigmented lesions and that can often be treated kind of conservatively um, is the, the thoughts of some people. I don't really have a good clinical um, experience with that disease, but, but that's my understanding. So I basically put HCIL and leave it up to the treating, um, uh, the treating physician to decide if they think it's, you know, squamous situ type solitary lesion or if they think it clinically fits for bonoid papulosis. This case was clinically felt to be bonoid papulosis, but I've seen the same pattern in other cases where it was not. I do think one important feature is that in the, particularly in anogenital um, HPV driven high grade dysplasia, h cell, I often see hyperpigmentation of the basal layer, increased melanin pigment to the point that sometimes these are biopsied thought to be seborrheic keratosis or even atypical melanocytic lesions clinically. So they can be very dark and I don't know why that is, but I feel like they oftentimes have increased pigment in the lesion. And this one's kind of subtle. It doesn't, you know, sometimes you can see really dramatic atypia. This is kind of a subtle atypia, but if you look around, you start seeing a lot of mitotic figures high up you can sometimes see good HPV viral change. Sometimes it's harder to appreciate. Um, can I get another area? There was an area up here that had like kind of more pleomorphic cells. Okay, maybe not. It was kind of multinucleated atypical cells up here in this area. But I think that the thing I think of is if I see a thick lesion that's blue, sometimes even if I see a separate keratosis that looks dark blue or purple, I'll go closer because I'm always worried that it could be a subtle squamous cell carcinoma in situ or in the you know, general area, H cell. Oh, come on. The one area I want is going to be the last pixel to come into focus. You got to be kidding me. All right, there it is. A little more atypia, but kind of subtle, but uh, this is H cell or in this case, bovinoid papulosis. Uh, 21. So this is a flinch biopsy. Uh-huh. 
and uh, we see mild inflammation over here with some papillary dermal edema okay. but i think if we go high power in the epidermis what's what's wrong with this epidermis uh there is no uh, stratum corneum excellent when the stratum corneum is completely gone here we see one flake of it that helps us as a clue but otherwise when it's completely gone sometimes our brain ignores that fact at first because it, it doesn't look abnormal it's missing right sometimes missing structures are harder for our brain i think to, at least my brain to pick up on than seeing something that's p present and abnormal obviously so i think sometimes you don't think about until you're like wait where's the stratum corneum so i think that's important and so what what is causing the stratum corneum to be missing here uh can be some uh bolus disorder yeah exactly yeah. it's a bolus disorder and the one clue we have are these detached keratinocytes floating around in what would have been a blister space if the corneal layer had not peeled off sometimes if you're lucky you can look around elsewhere in the slide and you'll find the miss missing stratum corneum sometimes it's it's gone and lost during processing here we've got a little bit of it and we can see like it's stratum corneum and a little bit of the granular layer again with detached fragments of keratinocyte there so that pattern the main things i think of is when the the corneal layer is missing and i see evidence of acantholysis that means that we have an acantholytic blistering process and either it's autoimmune in which case it'd be pemphigus foliaceus probably which is what this was um, and you would need direct immunofluorescence to confirm that um, and then the other things that can look like this would be staph scalded skin syndrome which will also have acantholysis and detachment of the corneum and to me the, the clinical is quite different for that but microscopically in my opinion pemphigus foliaceus and staph scalded skin can look identical I, I don't have a reliable way to tell those two apart and the other thing would be bolus impetigo although in bolus impetigo you usually will have neutrophils and bacteria in the blister space but if it washed out and 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 sloughed away it could look like this. I've also seen times where pemphigus foliaceus had secondary bacterial impetigenization and made me think of bolus impetigo, but in the end, it ended up being confirmed by DIF, uh, direct immunofluorescence, that it was actually foliaceous. So I think it's good to keep those three things in mind when you have the missing stratum corneum or a subcorneal split with acantholysis. So this was pemphigus foliaceous. Good job. Okay, we'll go, I'll go more quickly through these since as always, I'm running out of time. This was case uh, 22, and this could look like a Veruca at first glance. It's got a nice Veruca surface, even has vacuoles that could make you think of coilocytes. Uh, and there's some bright pink parakeratosis there, but when we look in the papillary dermis, what do we see? Foamy cells, vacuolated foamy histiocytes. So a verrucous lesion with foam cells in the papillary dermis, that's called a verruciform xanthoma. And the main differentials you could think of would be a regular Veruca. And also, one time I saw a case of Verrucous carcinoma that on a superficial shave looked very much like this and even had a touch of foamy cells, I thought. And then it was clinically concerning. They took it out and it was Verrucous carcinoma. But it can have this same pattern of bright pink parakeratosis. I've got a nice example on Kiko of a digital slide of a really like picture perfect Verruciform xanthoma. Wow, look at that bright pink uh parakeratosis there and a really great example you can go check that out i'll put a link down below and foamy cells in the papillary dermis this is like picture perfect bruce form xanthoma but here it's good to see not only the dramatic perfect ones but also the ones that are a bit more subtle so always go looking for the foam cells. The anogenital genital area and the oral cavity are the two most common areas to see verruciform xanthoma. And they often have neutrophils in the stratum corneum I've found. So good, good thing to know about. And unrelated to lipid abnormalities. All right. We've got a single solitary lesion. Clinically, they thought probably that it was a seb or a wart. And microscopically, we see a horn over top of it. I guess we could add this on as a fifth thing that could make a, a horn on our list of cutaneous horn. But what is this pattern called right here? Whoever would have been assigned to this case. I'm sorry I'm taking your glory from you. The epidermolytic hyperkeratosis. Yeah, epidermolytic hyperkeratosis, EHK. And it looks like the epidermis is falling apart or lysing. It's 
just an artifact. It's not real. It's because the keratin filaments are tangled up instead of filling the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm is empty and washes out and is clear after processing. And you get globules of pink, which are misfolded keratin filaments. And you also get globules of purple, which are big, chunky um, uh, keratohyaline granules. So both pink and purple blobs with pale, clear epidermis. And this, this is like a really nice characteristic one, but I find it can have a variety of different textures and and uh, mixtures of those findings I just mentioned, often with overlying hyperkeratosis with both ortho and para kind of scattered in there. So some people are born with this as a, as a form of ichthyosis, um, right, uh, which is because of germline mutations in keratin 1 or 10. And then also we see this as incidental foci, or occasionally we see this where it's clinically noticeable as a solitary lesion. And in that case, I like to call these uh, EHK omas, or the more proper name is an epidermolytic acanthoma or epidermolytic hyperkeratotic acanthoma. So if it was clinically thought to be a single lesion and biopsied, and what I see is all this, then we call it epidermolytic uh, uh, acanthoma or epidermolytic hyperkeratotic acanthoma. So it's a nice pattern to recognize. And it, when it shows up as incidental findings, I find that sometimes pathologists who are not familiar with this uh, get concerned about like, what is this weird finding? Is it weird HPV? I've seen it confuse people. Um, there are forms of it where you can have multiple little foci of it in the anogenital area. And I've seen people be concerned for HPV or other things. It, once you know this pattern exists, it's easy to recognize. And again, sometimes if you're having a bad day, you might think it looks a little like a mermesia wart. But I think if you compare this to the mermesia we saw, clearly very different um, once you've seen both side to side. Okay, 24. I'll just tell you it's a warty, it's an invagination down into the skin, usually a solitary papule on the face. The cells can look kind of big and a little atypical. So sometimes you could get concerned on a small shave if this could be actinic keratosis or the top of a squamous cell carcinoma. But when you get a deep enough biopsy, you see that this kind of uh, multiple little uh, reedy and vaginating down into the dermis have acantholysis and rounded dyskeratosis, looks like rounded parakeratosis or core rond and grains. So this mixture of acantholytic uh, dyskeratosis with a single lesion that invaginates down into the skin, usually on the face, that's called a warty dyskeratoma or a warty D, can have kind of a verrucous warty surface in the middle. But this kind of invaginated papilloma or uh, inverted papillomatous look at the edges. And these are benign and kind of cool to encounter. And there are a variety of other diseases that have acantholytic dyskeratosis in Dermpath, a very important um, uh, pattern to recognize because you can learn like five diseases for the price of one. Case 25, a nice veruca with hypergranulosis and a little vacuolated coilocytes there. Nice veruca vulgaris, as we've already discussed at length today. Case 26, I'll just tell you guys, I'm sorry for rushing through these. These poor cases that are like case 20 through 30 always get the the, the short end of the stick. So at first you could think of like a PG, but it's spindly here. And the spindle cells are running in fascicles, hyperchromatic, plump, scattered mitoses, but not usually pleomorphic. So I feel like this is a tumor that if you see it, you'll be like, it's atypical, but I'm not totally sure if it's malignant or not. And this is kind of a dark, darkly stained slide. But uh, these areas here, you'll find little slit-like spaces with blood in between. It's kind of out of focus there. Here we go. Slit-like spaces with blood and fascicles of somewhat atypical, but not wildly pleomorphic usually. Spindle cells, think about Kaposi sarcoma. So this is the kind of the nodular stage or tumor type stage of Kaposi sarcoma. And then when you cut those fascicles in cross-section, they have little holes with blood in them. So people often focus on the slit-like spaces, but I think the little holes are, are actually good too. And my mentor, Mark Edgar, said this is like the sieve or colander kind of pattern, like the spaghetti strainer pattern, where each little hole is filled with blood. And there will usually be plasma cells. And then if you have any doubt, you can do the uh, HHV8 um, stain, which is a really nice stain that's very sensitive and specific to confirm the diagnosis. So this is tumor stage Kaposi, and I have a long video about Kaposi. I'll put a link to it down below. So this one right here is uh, not really exciting at low power, but here's normal skin out here, normal epidermis. And then look at this abrupt transition to kind of 
uh, acanthotic epidermis where the keratinocytes become quite enlarged. And again, like we talked about, many types of viruses cause a nuclear and cytoplasmic enlargement of keratinocytes. Many of the viruses that affect keratinocytes do that. And um, you can see the nuclei are big and pale, but the most striking thing here is the cytoplasm, which suddenly has this really unique, beautiful blue-gray color, and instead of the pinkish kind of color. And so this, uh, this change, uh, it, this is called epidermodysplasia verruciformis, EDV. This is basically a variant of Veruca plana, in my, in my thinking. It's an HPV infection, and there are a variety of different HPV serotypes that have a tendency to cause this pattern. Um, and uh, it, for some reason, makes the keratinocytes get this cool cytoplasmic change that looks very beautiful and blue. Um, and then also, it will have other features, kind of like a flat wart. Um, sometimes papillomatosis, not so much in this case, but also hypergranulosis, which I feel is a, is a characteristic feature seen in all the different types of HPV infection in the skin. It's very common to see large, dark, hypergranular um, uh, keratohyaline granules in the stratum corneum. Okay, so that, that change is EDV change. We can see that in a few different settings. The name actually, epidermodysplasia verruciformis, I abbreviate it EDV, some people abbreviate EV whichever you like, um, it was described as a syndrome, and those are in people that have a, a germline defect in the EVER1 or EVER2 genes that predisposes them to HPV infection uh, with these subtypes of HPV, and they get many, many of these often darkly pigmented Veruca plana type flat warts that have this feature microscopically, and those patients um, uh, have a higher risk of developing squamous cell carcinoma. So um, that's a, a problematic um, and, and somewhat serious disease for people that are afflicted by it. I've only seen a couple of cases of real germline epidermodysplasia verruciformis in my practice um, in real life. But we see this finding incidentally as little tiny incidental foci in the skin of older adults next to skin cancers all the time. And I don't even usually mention it when it's just a small incidental focus. It's just a small finding that we see and on a relatively regular basis. But the reason I think it's good to know about for those cases is just so you, when you see this, you know what it is. Um, sometimes the little incidental findings in pathology don't matter much most of the time, but they matter when you notice it and it makes you worry about something more nefarious. So that's why I find it's good to know what all these little focal incidental findings are. Plus, to me, it's kind of one of the fun things about Dermpath that adds kind of granular knowledge uh, to our learning that uh, if you're a nerd like me, it makes it more fun. And in this case, if this were, you know, this lesion was clearly what the dermatologist was biopsying. So I would personally call this Veruca plana with epidermodysplasia verruciformis features. And if it was uncertain what the context was, I would bring up that if this patient has many uh, flat wart like lesions over the body, they should get worked up for genetic abnormality of ever one or ever two. Or I've also seen uh, lesions that were large flat warts like this in the setting of transplant or other immune suppression. And I've sometimes seen areas that look like this mingle with squamous cell carcinoma in situ in transplant patients. So those are a few different settings when I've seen um, EDV epidermodysplasia bruciformis. And I have uh, many other posts about this on my Kiko, um, Kiko Mega Index of Dermpath. So you can go check those out if you want to see other examples. I think this case actually, I believe this case actually was from a patient with, with confirmed um, epidermodysplasia bruciformis, uh, if I recall. And then finally, case uh, 28 uh, is an important disease that I don't think I've covered before. So I wanted to take the time to go over it and I didn't want to make the poor derm residents late to clinic. So here we have a big shave biopsy, and you can tell that this is thickened acanthotic epidermis with elongated reedy, and it's got a lot of serum scale crust with inflammation on the surface. Look at all of this, parakeratosis, fibrin and serum, and neutrophil debris just from low power. Surely we're going to find some bacterial and patogenization when we go closer. So this appearance microscopically corresponds to what this looks like clinically, which would be wet, kind of weeping, eroded and ulcerated, or sometimes people use the word macerated plaques in the anogenital area and often too in the axilla, sometimes also around the folds of skin on the neck in some patients. And usually the patient will have this and also will have other family members with this. So that's an important clinical 
um, scenario. And then here's the microscopic feature that we see. In addition to the abundant scale crust and serum, we could already tell that the epidermis is falling apart. And it's, it could look like spongiosis at first glance, but in other areas we can see that there's actual detached keratinocytes that have rounded edges. And so when I see that, that's acantholysis, okay? So it's important though, I think, to keep in mind that acantholysis and spongiosis can have overlapping morphology microscopically sometimes. If you just had this, you could certainly just think of spongy, like right here, spongiotic dermatitis. But once I start seeing single cells coming loose and rounding up and floating in the space, and you can't really tell on this scan because it's not a great H and E, it's a little bit faded. <clears throat> but also um, in, in a, a more nicely stained specimen, the keratinocyte cytoplasm gets more dense and more pink usually. As the cell rounds up, the, the keratin filaments get more get thicker, they're not as stretched out, and it makes the cytoplasm look denser and more pink. Like you can kind of appreciate in these cells here is what's starting to happen. So those are all clues. If I see that, I think of acantholysis. And that's important because a handful of diseases have acantholysis. Acantholytic, acantholysis plus dyskeratosis, we can think of, uh, uh, we can think of, uh, warty uh, dyskeratoma, like we talked about earlier, Grover's disease, um, Derrier's disease, and others. But when we just have acantholysis, usually without the rounded dyskeratosis, we can think of Haley-Haley disease, which is what this is, also known as benign familial pemphigus or benign chronic pemphigus. It looks a lot like pemphigus vulgaris, except it is not actually immune mediated. It is due to a genetic, an inherited genetic defect in an ATPase, uh, which is, a, I believe, a calcium channel transporter in the endoplasmic reticulum of cells. And um, the particular one involved here is ATP 2C1, and I think in the, if I recall in Derrier's disease, it's ATP, uh, ATPA is 2A2, but here in uh, Haley Haley, ATPA is 2A, or 2C1. And uh, the way the dermatology residents I've trained have taught me to remember this is they always have the best mnemonics, it seems, for memorizing obscure points. They said, I want to see Haley's Comet one day. And so Haley Haley disease, ATPA is 2C1. There you go. If it works for you, keep it. And the pattern of acantholytic keratinocytes, how they're kind of connected and rounded up, has been uh, likened to a dilapidated brick wall or a very old brick wall in which the corners of the brick have eroded away over the many, many years and rounded up. And I was, uh, I was in Italy <clears throat> in Rome last year and I was near the Colosseum and found a brick wall that I don't know if it was how old it was, but it was very old, as is everything in Italy, I think. And so I took pictures of it. I'll have to post those because I was like, ooh, I'm going to use this for teaching Haley Haley disease, a, a bona fide Roman dilapidated brick wall. I don't know if it was actually from the Roman era or later times, but in any case, uh, it did look a little bit like this if you have a very good imagination. But I think it's also important when you see this to keep in mind actual autoimmune pemphigus. And um, if there's any doubt about that, direct immunofluorescence will sort that out. And also there are times where you can see this pattern of acantholysis in the genital area, but instead of big plaques or a family history, it will be multiple small papules. And that's called, I believe that's called uh, acantholytic dermatosis of the genitocural area because it involves the, uh, the genital area or the thighs. Um, the inner thighs, and it can microscopically mimic Haley Haley, but clinically does not have the same uh, uh, presentation or, or um, I don't believe there's a familial link to it that I know of, but I've only seen that a couple times, so uh, there may be things I don't know about that disease, but that's another thing to keep in mind in this differential, all right? And uh, sometimes Grover's disease can, can lack dyskeratosis and just have a pattern kind of dilapidated brick wall-like. So if you see this pattern, but it's itchy bumps on the trunk, of an older adult that it's probably actually Grover's disease, not Haley Haley. So the pattern plus the clinical really matters in these acantholytic and dyskeratotic diseases. All right, but this is a really good example of Haley Haley disease. And I actually did see this once in clinic when I was a fellow and the patient was very nice and had had this disease their whole life and other family members did. And, and uh, that patient mentioned to me that he had been actually diagnosed by one of the Haley brothers who I believe were both dermatologists who are brothers who uh, first described uh, this syndrome. And he was one of the patients that they had seen in their clinic 
Um, uh, and they, of course, had many patients with this disease. So I thought that was a really cool um, historical link, and I was thankful for that patient sharing that story uh, with me. And um, that's where Haley and Haley, it's Haley-Haley, it's because it were two brothers, both with the last name of Haley. So there you go. Try that out at your next cocktail party and see if your friends think it's a cool uh, point of medical history. Well, if you've stuck around this long, I hope you enjoyed the session. And uh, thanks very much for watching. Have a great day. And please uh, consider liking and subscribing to my channel if you're on YouTube or follow me on Kiko if you're viewing me there. Thanks a bunch.